I noticed that there are other channels and they try to lump everything in together. They'll say CB350, 400, 500, 550, yada, yada. And they'll try to do a blanket, one video gets all. And they're not hurting anything by doing that, but you're missing some of the details that I think are important. And what I mean by that is um, the clearances for this motorcycle are gonna vary from other motorcycles. Now, if you do them all the same, probably nothing bad is gonna happen. You might be leaving a hair of power on the table and you know the manual says to adjust a certain way. That's how I wanna do it. The other thing I've noticed several videos, again, trying to lump these bikes all together, have said that the service interval for this is every 1500 miles. And that is true of a lot of 70s vintage Hondas. But the service interval for the valves on this engine are every 3000 miles. So I just wanted to make something that is specific to the CB400. And I wanted to make something that is explicit. You know, it's, it's not a generic video. It's you've got this bike, this is going to work for you. This manual is also specific to the 350. These are very similar engines. They look almost identical. There's some nuances, obviously one's a 350 and the other's a 400. Um, but as far as adjusting the valves, it's exactly the same. There's no difference there. So just want to uh, share that, you know, and if I'm saying something cor incorrectly, obviously somebody can come and correct me, <laughs> but I'm trying to make this as accurate as possible so that I can help people and save a little bit of time. I already have the gas tank off and I've moved the throttle cables out of the way down here. Also just kind of moved the plug wires out of the way. I've removed the plugs as well and that'll make it easier for us to turn the engine over and tell where the compression stroke is so we know where if we're in the right spot. The tachometer drive cable is also moved out of the way. This clutch cable is not supposed to be mounted here. Long story, but it'll be moved into the correct position, I assure you. We also have the points cover removed, so our points and our mechanical advancer are in here, and we'll be paying close attention to this. Tools that you will need for a valve adjustment on a CB400 or a you know, CB350F, I suppose, uh, are gonna be a 22 millimeter socket, and we use that to rotate the crankshaft. You'll need a 16 millimeter spark plug remover. This is part of the original toolkit because somehow I still don't have a 16 millimeter spark plug uh, socket. Uh, you'll need a 17 millimeter wrench to remove the valve cover caps. When you put them back on, do not over tighten them had one explode on me before. I don't know how that happened, but it did. Uh, and this is something, this is why I kind of am doing this again, is I've already adjusted the valves here, but we want to go to 0.05 millimeters on both the intake and the exhaust. So this is a feeler gauge. This is a Motion Pro feeler gauge, which is a little bit nicer than I usually spring for. Usually go with just the cheap eBay feeler gauges, not on purpose necessarily, that's just what I have around and that's what I end up using. But I had to buy this separate because those kits don't go this thin. Um, hopefully this works a little bit better. It wasn't cheap, you know. Uh, you'll need a 10 mil for various bolts and doodabs uh, to get them out of the way. And then this kind of threw me for a loop too. Again, I, I work on bikes and I've had quite a few different old Hondas old Kawasaki's, what, what have you. This one's been different, and I'm sure this is common, but I just haven't encountered it. So I had to get, you know, this little square guy uh, for the top of the valves here. So you can see it's a square point, and then this nut is a nine millimeter. I'm used to having a flat head in here and a 10 millimeter. So a little bit different. I haven't decided if I like this tool yet. So you might see me switch over to a nine millimeter wrench just to get, you know, kind of a feel for it. Because again, as the name implies, we are trying to get a feel here. So 
we'll go ahead and dig in. The first thing that we need to do is be on the one and four compression stroke. So see if we can get in here. So we'll get our 22 millimeter in here and we're gonna rotate our crankshaft until we see one and four. So we want to be on the T mark of one and four that's our fire mark. So that's where the points are going to begin to break and um, spark. Now, when the engine accelerates, it's going to be in between these two guys, which are our advance marks. So the weights on the advancer will come out and set the timing so that it sparks a little bit earlier. We want to be again on the T of one and four, and the T stands for top dead center. So that means that one and four pistons are all the way at the top of the piston stroke. From here, they will only go down. The reason that this is important is because <clears throat> on the compression stroke of one and four, we are closing both valves. We're basically making something to squeeze that gas and air mixture as it explodes so that it can force that piston down. If it's not on the compression stroke, then one of the valves is going to be canted down. So we should be on the compression stroke here of four because I can move these. If, if they're pressing the valve down, then they're absolutely not on the compression stroke. The other way to tell is to put your finger over the spark plug hole and you'll be able to feel that air pushing against your fingers. That's why I said we wanna take the spark plugs out because if you have them in, you're going to be fighting against every compression stroke on this engine as you turn it over. So if you're, if you're out, you know, if you're on the wrong one, then just go around again and you'll find it uh, no problem. I know I'm presenting as Mr. YouTube guy, but I'm not an expert. I'm relatively comfortable, but I wouldn't call myself an expert. So I like to check the manual just to make sure that I haven't forgotten or missed anything. And we are at top dead center on the compression stroke of the first cylinder. So this on our side here is cylinder number one, two, three, four, pretty straightforward. So, and I may, you know, flip this up if it looks bad on the TV, but in the manual, you can see here that we are going to get on the compression stroke at TDC for cylinder number one. And then we are going to check the valves on all of the O's. Then we're gonna rotate it 360 degrees and then we're gonna do all of the X's. So pretty simple. I know some people don't like this, but I mean, it makes sense to me. I just have to, you know, use my brain and make sure that, you know, because if you're doing it this way, if you have the, you know, it's kind of backwards, I guess, but just make sure you keep track of intake and exhaust. Although you should be able to see that the valve is partly depressed and notice that it's not loosening up. Um, still, just be diligent, take your time. And you know, if this is your first time, maybe double check your work, but we're gonna start and do cylinder number one here. So we'll go ahead and uh, break it loose. And you can tell there that's nice and nice and loose. There's no pressure on it. Everybody has a different opinion about how to feel when they're doing their adjustment because it's you know we're, we're feeling um, <laughs> drives me nuts a little bit. 
personally, but I, I'm one of those people who likes to have a definitive answer for something. So, you know, when you're telling me I've got to feel it out, uh, that that's frustrating. So, um, yeah, we'll just kind of back this nut off and then bring, bring this back down until it kind of seats just a little bit. And then these are very thin. So two thousandths or 0 0.05 millimeters is not a whole lot of clearance um, in the spectrum of things here. So let's see if we can get it under there. Geez. And now it's tight. That's just barely. We've got a little bit of a tug there. It's nice and easy to tell. I can tell this is oiled up. So here's the tricky part where we keep this exactly in the position that it is. And try to bring that lock nut in there. And this is where I'm beginning. I, I don't like this guy because they have to be together. I can't see and feel. Feel our gauges, feeling, can't feel as well. So give me a second. I'm going to get my open ended wrench. All right, just got our nine millimeter here. And, uh, you know, lived a lot of my life wondering when I was ever going to use a nine millimeter or 11 millimeter. It does happen. So I'm kind of putting a little bit of pressure to counteract my tightening and then I've still got I mean there's a little bit of resistance there but I can still get it under there without a ton of trouble and with valve adjustments it's better to be a little bit loose than a little bit too tight the reason that we want valve lash is because metal gets hot and it expands. So when it expands, if this is, there's no lash and this is touching the valve, when it gets hot and expands, it may not allow that valve to come up and close all the way. We want just a little bit of a gap there so that that valve has the opportunity to close fully. But the flip side of that is we don't want it too loose because then we're not opening it as much as we possibly could. So it's kind of a balance, right? We, we don't want to leave any power on the table because the bigger we can open the valves, the more air and the more gas we can shove into the engine, which means the bigger explosion and the more power that we have. So um, if, if there's no you know, gap here and this expands and that valve can't fully close, then a couple of things can happen. So I have my mom's uh, push mower. It's a commercial grade push mower. It's got a nice Honda engine on it. it. Wasn't starting and it was coughing out of the intake. And, you know, my mom and dad had tried to figure out what's going on with it. And they had all these tricks that they had that they thought were getting it to start. Well, the valve cover on that is on the front and it got dented and it was holding the intake valve open just a little bit. So when that engine was on the compression stroke, it was never getting compression and the gas and air mixture was going back out the intake, but it was still getting ignited. So it would backfire through the intake. Figured it out, took a little while because you never know what you're gonna get into. So that can be a bad thing. Obviously we don't have compression then we don't have very good power with our engine. The other side that can happen over on the exhaust is if there's no lash over here, then when you start losing a little bit of compression, that gas and air mixture as it's igniting is going to exit the exhaust and then you're more likely to uh, burn a valve or the part of the head is gonna get very hot there because those gases aren't exploding inside of the cylinder, they're exploding as they're exiting. And um, you hear people talk about burnt valves, that can happen for probably other reasons too, but in this particular case, having that valve lash is important. Some engines will say, oh, it sounds like a sewing machine because you've got these little guys tapping away just a little bit. 
this engine, the, the valve clearance is very small, so it's going to be probably a little bit quieter than some other engines. But again, tangent, but that's why we want valve lash, if you didn't know. That one might have moved around. Yep, see, now I gotta do it again. Yep. Yep, that's not bad. I wanna make sure these are tight. I have an engine was in pretty sorry shape. The uh, previous owner didn't tighten this down all the way and these both came out flopping around in there, chewed up the camshaft and made a big mess of everything. So something else that you can do if you're concerned about your valve being too loose or too tight. Some folks like to do the, the, the go, no go on the uh, feeler gauges. I don't know that I 100% agree with it because um, sometimes you can be pretty tight uh, on the correct size if you get in a no-go situation. So um, in this case, you know, I've got 0.08 and 0.05 here. So I'm shooting for 0.05. If I take my 0.08 and get in here, I might be able to get it in there. Oh, but you can see it's not easy to get it in there. So that's probably a good indicator. And then we come back with our 05 here and I have some drag, but it's not, I'm not cramming it in there, right? Like it's, it's sticking. It may, maybe a smidge tight, but I can't get my eight in there and I don't have too much trouble getting my fives in there. So you know, we're going to be pretty close there. We'll call it good. Move on to the next. Again, we are at TDC on cylinder number one. So we're doing the intake and the exhaust. Or this is the exhaust intake for cylinder number one. And then we are going to do the exhaust on cylinder number two. And then we are going to do the intake on cylinder number three. And we are going to do nothing on cylinder number four. Okay, so every time I do valves, it seems like I kind of get in the zone. I'm like, ah, that feels good. And then I go back, do another one or another two. And I'm like, all right, now nah, I better go check those. And so you kind of just get a feel for what's light. You know, you want a, a slight drag. It's, I can't show you in a YouTube video, unfortunately, like how a, a drag on a feeler gauge feels. But something to note, and I'll be quick here, is if you're using those cheapos, um, feeler gauges like these, you'll see them all over Amazon and what have you. And, and I'm not saying that they're bad. I, I think that they're probably accurate enough for what we're trying to do here. If you get these in here, now let me bring it over here so you can see what I'm talking about. If you bring this in, it's going to be riding up against that cylinder, that valve cover area, right? And what can happen is then you're putting tension on your feeler gauge and then you're not getting an accurate feel. The other thing that can happen is if you're trying to adjust this and you're, you got a little bit of weight on it, 
you know, if you're, you know, pressing while you're feeling, you got to be really careful not to do that. And of course, there's that rigmarole where you're tightening it and you won't, don't want it to move, but don't press on it. And these are things that are happening that I've got to keep in mind myself. So I'm not just telling you, I'm telling me too. But we have our intake and exhaust on cylinder one done. We have our exhaust on cylinder two done. And we have our intake on cylinder three done. So now we need to rotate the engine 360 degrees back to one and four again. Only this time, this cylinder is going to be on that compression stroke. And I'm going to try, hopefully you guys can, you know, hear the compression when I do this. A little tricky at times, but you can hear that there. So we got T, one and four. See if we can even see the piston down in there, right? Probably not. I can see it. You probably can't see it. But I can see the pistons at the top. If you shine a little flashlight down in there, you should be able to also. So now we're going to do intake and exhaust on four. It's kind of basically from the other side, the same thing, right? So on number four, intake, exhaust, and then on Number three, we're going to do the exhaust here. So those are all loose. And then we're going to do the intake on number two. And then might rotate it over one more time just to see if they're kind of, you know, make sure I didn't forget anything, mess anything up. But that's, you know, the gist of it essentially from here once once we're done i'll get the tank back on and because i have the carburetors off they're going to need to be synced but that's not the point of this video okay so we got the valves pretty well squared away if you will anyway another tip i kind of thought about right is if you are going through this exercise and you're finding like, ah, it's too tight now, or ah, oh, crap, it's too loose, and I gotta start all over again. You don't. You can just barely crack it loose. Just, I mean, not all the way loose, but start to bring it back the other direction, and just slightly give it just a, you know, half a degree a turn. I've found that that works pretty good, and then you don't have to, you know, start over all over again every time you're not right there. And maybe that's very obvious for everybody else, um, but there's plenty of things that should have been obvious to me at the outset and took me a long time to figure out. Sometimes the hard way. Appreciate you all for watching. If this is the kind of thing that you like or that you needed, take the time to comment. I took a lot of time making these videos it takes a lot of time to one just work on a bike and then you know we're talking about filming it making it interesting editing it and uh making sure that everything is correct enough that the angry folks on youtube won't come chasing me down so you know again i i'm genuinely thankful that anybody watches these so uh there's something else you'd like to know about that I haven't uh, shared so far, tell me. I'll try and get it out there for you. Otherwise, I am going to put this bike back together and I'm going to enjoy it this weekend, hopefully. That's the part that I look forward to is filming this thing going down the road. Oh, and before I forget, something I did earlier. While you've got this off, again, these are old bikes, so check on them. You've got these little guys down here. Uh, that's a piece of felt with oil on it that keeps that cam lubricated. It's probably not very well lubricated after it's been sitting for 50 years. So consider checking that, putting some oil on it. Uh, I need to check the 
advance mechanism back here to make sure that it's not too gummed up. I think, I, I know it's working, but probably needs a little bit of love. All right, well, thank you for watching. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully your CB350 or CB404 is running awesome and you can uh, crank that hog. See ya.